What's up? Good to be with y'all this morning. Hey, if you're new, my name is Billy. If I didn't get to meet you on the way in, I'd love to meet you afterwards on the patio. Um, I'm a person who enjoys people who, who really know about their interests and they're passionate about it. Like if you want to get me hooked on whatever you're about, know it and be passionate about it. Uh, I love great food, great drinks. So I'm always on Yelp, Google, I'm checking out reviews of restaurants. In Denver, we have multiple Michelin star restaurants. But not even in that category, we got other ones that do like multiple courses. They have like cool experiences, vibes. I love it. Uh, A couple weeks ago, my family and I, we took a trip, we were in California, and it was my wife's birthday. So I took her to a really nice restaurant. We went to this restaurant called Tia Carmen. And uh, when we get there, there's this giant wooden door that they open and it kind of like unveils the restaurant. We walk in, it's super nice, it's decorated awesome. We sit down, there's one of those like open kitchen concept things and uh, there's a guy calling out the orders and the cooks behind the line are like, yes, chef, like in the movies. You're like, ooh, this is cool, okay, we've got a vibe here. We order our food and they bring it. Tastes amazing, but it's not just the taste, it's the presentation. So I've got some pictures because if you love food, you take pictures of it. Uh, This is the steak we had. And I don't know who made this rule, but it's just true. If there's a flower on your plate, it's bougie. Like you just are like, yeah, I'm, I'm a, okay, we're here. This was dessert. It was called the jewelry box. Like six pieces of dessert came on this glass case. You're like, this is cool. Uh, and then there was these like corn fritters with honey. I think if they heard me say corn fritters with honey, they'd have a heart attack. It's like not what they call it. Uh, just because I like nice restaurants doesn't mean I fit in. Right, like when, when Kelsey's at a restaurant, she's like elegant, she's like good posture. I'm a little different at a nice restaurant. My favorite thing to do is there's always that thing on the menu like this that it's in another language and they describe it some crazy way. And I'm like, what's smirk, 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 smirk. And they do this like crazy explanation that you're like, okay. Sounds like corn fritters with honey. And you can see their face go like, part of me wants to just say yes, cause you're like a person, I want you to know what you're having. But they've been trained not to. So they go this like huge roundabout way to explain what corn fritters with honey are to me. And I'm like, no, I got it, okay. The guy brings it. I'm like, hey, those rocks around there, we don't eat those. He's like, no, it's just for presentation. I'm like, yeah, that's what I, th- that's what I thought. So, so we're in this nice restaurant. It's like beautiful. They bring this, this incredible presentation. It tastes amazing. And the service was out of this world. Like they're just always taking care of you. We were traveling, so my kids were tired from the day. Uh, this is a picture of them asleep at the booth. Uh, and so they're a little on edge when we get there. And so they bring out French fries and ketchup, not even on the menu. And they're like, compliments of the chef. And I'm like, dang, let's go. First class. Kids fell asleep. So Kelsey and I ate all the French fries, but I appreciate the gesture. Okay. And so now that, that I've told you about this restaurant, right, you know a lot about that restaurant, right? You know about the food, you know about, about, that, about the presentation, you know about the service, you know how good it looks but are you satisfied seeing that steak or do you want to taste it, right? Are you satisfied uh, knowing the presentation, knowing about the service or do you want to experience it? And this can happen with us in our relationship with Jesus. We can become so satisfied knowing everything about him and we miss out on actually knowing him and experiencing him. We miss out on knowing Jesus and experiencing him. We can listen to other people talk about him. This can happen, we come in on a Sunday, like, man, I'm seeing other people experience him, but I'm missing out on this, and all I'm doing is knowing more about him. And so if you're in this room this morning, and you're like, hey, I, I, I don't know Jesus, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, first of all, what's up? Welcome. We are super glad you're here, but hopefully you're tracking with me. You're like, yeah, yeah, I showed up today because I've heard about him, and I've heard things of him, so I showed up today to learn more. Uh, but if you're in here and you're like, man, I have a relationship with Jesus. I'd say I, I've walked with him, I've experienced him. I'd say I know him, I'm with you. And I wanna share a verse from Exodus that convicted me as I was preparing for this message and thinking about that. And here's what you need to know about this verse. It's in Exodus chapter 33, not chapter one, not two, not three, not four, not five. That's a LeBron James joke for the four people in here who got that. Moses, such so Exodus 33, Moses is 80 years old. He's 80, he has spent some time with the Lord. And then Moses not only has spent time with the Lord, but he's experienced him. Moses has had these experiences talking to the burning bush, right? Parting the Red Sea, the plagues, throughout the wilderness. 
He's experienced God on Mount Sinai, getting the Ten Commandments, experiencing God's presence. All these miracles, this experience, this talking with God. When I think of Moses, I'm like, has anyone talked to God more than him? Right? He didn't just look him up on Instagram and be like, oh, got to feel for God. Like he really knows, he's really close to him. But in Exodus 33, verse 13, Moses is speaking to God and he says this, Lord, verse 13, teach me your ways so that I may know you. So that I may know you. Moses, you don't know God? You don't know, th- this is a problem. I, Billy, I think I know God and I have not had these experiences. I didn't talk to a bush that got shot by the flamethrower, right? I, I have not gone to the top of the mountain and sat in God's presence for 40 days. I've had two 14ers in my life. My main goal is try to breathe, don't die. I can last 40 seconds up there, not 40 days, right? I, I haven't walked on dry land where there was an ocean the night before. After we went through the parting of the Red Sea sermon, I went home and took a cup of water and blew in it to show my kids what it was like. (sighs) Wow, that's my experience of that. And Moses is going, teach me your way so that I may know you. Now, obviously Moses knows God, right? Two two verses before this, uh, in verse 11, it says, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one who speaks to a friend. So Moses is speaking to God face to face. He's having all these experiences. And yet he goes, God, teach me your ways. I wanna know you even more. I wanna know you even more. And so the question for us this morning is, are you satisfied in what you know about Jesus? Or do you wanna know and experience him more? We pray with me as we just get ready for this morning and consider that. Jesus, you are a wonderful counselor, your mighty God, your everlasting father, your prince of peace. And Jesus, you are Lord and you are king and you are savior of my life. But Jesus, I don't just wanna know about you. I don't wanna know those facts about you. I wanna know you and I wanna experience you. Lord, will you speak to us today through your word, through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, teach us your way so that we may know you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen. So we, we are in our last week of this Exodus series. And uh, next week, we're kicking off a series called Kingdom Builders. You are not gonna wanna miss that. It's gonna be awesome. And uh, today, I wanna talk about knowing Jesus, right, through this lens of Exodus. And you might be thinking, Billy, uh, Jesus isn't in Exodus. Fair point. But what we're gonna see is all these ties, the fingerprints of Jesus all throughout Exodus. And really, he goes throughout all of scripture. Jesus is tied throughout all of scripture. Luke 24, 27 says this, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. All scriptures point to Jesus. He can explain every scripture and how it points and concerning himself. And so what I want us to do is to better know him through Exodus. And I wanna do that by answering just a simple question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? I've got three answers for that. Number one, Jesus is the lamb of God and our deliverer. Jesus is the lamb of God and our deliverer. When Pharaoh uh, wouldn't let the Israelites leave uh, and go with Moses, uh, God sent the plagues down, right? So there's 10 plagues. The final plague was that every firstborn uh, human and animal would get killed in Egypt. And God tells Moses and the Israelites, those who have the blood of the lamb painted over their door, death will pass over and they won't die. That's why they call it the Passover. Death passed over those homes. And so in Exodus 12, 13, it says, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destruction, uh, no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And so, so, so we experience this, this lamb in Exodus as they sacrifice the lambs, painting the blood over the doorstep, saving them in Egypt, and Jesus is referenced throughout scripture as the lamb of God. He's referenced all throughout scripture as the lamb of God, and this tie between Exodus and Jesus and his death as the final lamb is really incredible. Jesus, uh, uh, when he died on the cross, that week they were celebrating the Passover meal. So after Exodus, every year they celebrate and remember what God did when death passed over them and they delivered him from Egypt. And so they celebrate that every year and and Jesus' death was on the week of Passover. The last supper was a Passover meal, right? He's with his disciples. That's one of the Passover meals they celebrated. And then the day that Jesus died, the day he was crucified was the day of preparation. So as they're celebrating Passover, 
there's a day where they kill the lambs as an atonement, a payment for all their sin. And so on this day in all the temples, uh, all the lambs were being killed, right? On the same day that Jesus would be crucified as the final atonement, the final payment for sin and death. So Jesus, he's the lamb of God. He's the atonement for our sins. And he's not just the lamb, he's also our deliverer. He was sent to deliver us and he wants to set us free. If you're coming in here today, you're like, man, Jesus is Lord, he's savior, but I'm struggling. I need help. I need to be delivered. I need to be rescued. That is what Jesus does. Exodus 3, 7 through 10, it says, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. Jesus is concerned about your suffering. Whatever you're going through, he is concerned and he wants to be with you, right? If you're feeling trapped, enslaved in something, he is concerned for you. Verse eight, it says, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Man, what are you going through? What do you struggle with? Man, I need rescuing, I need a deliverer. Right, is there something in your life that hasn't happened yet? You're going, God, I need deliverance here. Is there something that's been happening to you? You're like, man, I know this is me being oppressed. I know this is me, 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 me suffering. I know this is an attack. I need a rescuer. Jesus wants to step into that. Any, any struggle, any lie, any temptation, you're like, man, I can't overcome this. Jesus wants to step into that. He's concerned of it and he wants to rescue you from that. That word rescue in verse eight, it's the Hebrew verb netzal. I wanna read this definition to you. Netzal means to snatch, pull, or take away from danger or harm. It conveys the idea of someone being powerfully and swiftly removed from a threatening situation. The word implies a sense of urgency and power, suggesting that God is intervening dramatically to save his people. Man, if you're in here today, and as I'm going through, hey, what are you going through? Is there something happening? Is there something that hasn't happened? Is there a struggle? Is there a lie? Man, we need a sense of urgency and power that can only come from Jesus. And so after we take communion, we're gonna have people praying in the back. We'd love to pray for you with a sense of urgency and power. Some expectation of Jesus as our lamb and our deliverer. So, so where do you need rescuing? Right, and in the same way that Moses was sent to deliver the Israelites, Jesus was sent for us. Luke 4, 18 and 19, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you see how similar that wording is between Exodus 3 and Luke 4, right? Like setting the oppressed free, the prisoners free, the enslavement freedom. Like it's the same language between Moses and Jesus as these delivers. And they have so many similarities. Jesus and Moses have a ton of similarities. Um, before Moses came, there was 400 years from the end of Genesis before he came to deliver his people. At the end of Malachi, the Old Testament, there's 400 years before Jesus is born. They both had, had an evil king killing off the newborns in their, their respective cities. They both had a time of exile in Egypt. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai. But now here's where they differ. Now, this is big, don't miss this. Jesus claimed to be the son of God and the final deliverer to cover all sin and death. Moses did not. Moses knew who he was and knew who God was, right? That, that, that is Jesus. He is the lamb of God. He is the deliverer. In Hebrews, it talks about how Moses was a shadow of what was to come in Christ Jesus. So Jesus, he's, he's our deliverer. We can choose to know him in that. And as we know Jesus as our lamb and our deliverer, I want us to think, how can we better know him through that? And what I do is on a regular basis, I tell myself the gospel, the good news of Jesus, what he did. As followers of Jesus, sometimes we do the craziest thing and we forget why we're here. What the whole point of this is, why we even believe what we believe and it's the gospel. And so on a regular basis, I'm going, man, God, I need to remember your sacrifice and your love for me. And at Restoration, we do that through a tool called Three Circles. Uh, I keep it on my phone as a sticker so that I don't forget and I can share it with anybody who I come across. But basically what this is, is that we, we all start in a perfect relationship with God, but we've all gone our own way. 
We go, man, I can be God. I know what's best. I'm gonna go my way. Israel would have understood that. I'm gonna go my own way. And what that leads to is everyone has done that. And so we live in a broken, fallen world. And in this broken world, we try to escape through all these different means, whatever it is for you, right? Drinking, sex and relationships, power, money, whatever it is, you're trying to escape from this broken world, but you get slingshotted back in it and it just is a cycle of this broken world. But if, if we can receive and pray and receive this gift of Jesus coming down from heaven to earth, down arrow, dying on the cross to pay for our sin and, and death, covering us with his blood and believe that he raised three days later from the dead and make him savior and king, that's a crown up there, make him savior and king, we'll be restored to a perfect relationship with Jesus. Man, I'm reminding myself of the gospel, of his sacrifice, of his mercy, of his grace, so I can know him more as my lamb and as my deliverer. So Jesus, lamb of God, deliver We know more through the gospel. Our second answer here is that Jesus is our help in the wilderness. Jesus is our help in the wilderness. Um, for the second half of this series, we have been focused on uh, the Israelites walking through the wilderness, right? They've gone through the Red Sea and they're walking through the wilderness, escaped from Egypt, heading to the promised land. And the wilderness throughout scripture, it's this place of, of pruning, of testing, of preparation, of transformation. And Jesus understands the wilderness. Right after Jesus gets baptized, he actually gets sent out. He goes straight into the wilderness and it says that he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He gets the wilderness. Matthew 4, one through two, it says, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So right after he gets baptized, goes into the wilderness, but it's right when he comes out of the wilderness that Jesus actually starts his whole ministry. A lot of times it's out of the wilderness where God transforms us and proves us and tests us that something incredible happens. And in our lives sometimes, right after being baptized or taking a step of obedience or faithfulness to God, the enemy, Satan, will attack us. He wants to get you to think, hey, this decision you've made, this walk of faithfulness, that was a mistake. You shouldn't have done that. He tries to, get, tries to lie to us to get us to not obey and follow Jesus. And he'll try to throw you into a wilderness to get you to believe that, right? So after a step of faithfulness, you get thrown into the wilderness, the enemy attacks, or sometimes what happens in our life is we just run into the wilderness on our own. God's going, man, I've got a promised land for you. I've got an awesome place here for you. You know what? I'm good. I'm gonna just go run into this crazy wilderness right now. And this is exactly what happened to the Israelites. After they leave Egypt, it only takes them two years to get to the promised land. And you might be thinking, uh, I thought they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They do eventually, but parting of the Red Sea, walking through the wilderness, two years. They get to the promised land and Moses sends out 12 scouts, one from each tribe, and they go scout the promised land. And they come back and they're afraid. They go, man, there are some bad dudes down there. Some big mamma jammas. I don't think we could take them. And out of this fear and doubting of God's promise, they don't enter the promised land. And they go and they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Look, the takeaway for us, don't create your own wilderness. Right, right. Don't, don't go out of your way to head to the wilderness when God has the promised land. Life is hard enough. Amen. Yeah, we don't need to go run into our own wilderness. We don't need to create that for ourselves. I'd argue in this moment for Israel, it's a great example of them knowing about God, but not knowing and experiencing him. Because they're like, man, I know, I kind of know God's promise. I kind of know he was gonna give us this land. I kind of know him from walking a little bit, but I don't, I haven't truly really experienced him. I'm not walking with him right now where I go, it actually doesn't matter what's down there. I'm going anyway because God's promises are always yes. God's promises are always yes. Second Corinthians 1.20, it says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. His promises are always yes in Christ. And I think the challenge for us is knowing, uh, is this promise from God or is this me? Right, because everything we want in life is not a promise from God. And so we have to have this discernment, this way of going, man, God, is this your promise? Is this me kind of wanting this? And we need God's word in that, right? We need the Bible. We need to be in scripture because his, his promises are all throughout scripture. 
so we can better know them and, and, and discern that. And then we need to take time and listen to the Holy Spirit and go, man, will you speak to me, Lord? We speak to me on this promise. We speak to me on what you have for me. And start to discern that and then hang out with other believers who are reading God's word and listening to the Holy Spirit so they can speak into it. Speak into that. And so when, when we have a promise from God, it's yes in Jesus. It's always yes in Jesus when we know it's from God. And Jesus wants to help us in the wilderness. He actually wants to help us wherever we are, whether it's from us running in or from, from an enemy attack or circumstances of this fallen, broken world, he wants to help us in the wilderness. But the question is, will you let him? Will you let him help you? Um, have you ever had a jar or a bottle that's like impossible to open? Right? You're just like, I cannot get this thing. The best time for that to happen is when there's a room full of dudes. Because then like competition, testosterone just starts flying through the air. We had a RST men's grill out Friday night. It was awesome. You want more information about that? Come talk to me in the future. Uh, that's the perfect place for this to happen. Now, I'm not a big sparkling water fan, but Topo Chico Twist of Lime in that glass bottle, y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's incredible. So um, this is what would happen in that situation. You go, hey man, I'm gonna try to open this bottle, right? You can't get it. And so usually then every single guy in the room head whips like, this is my moment to prove my manhood. Let's open this bottle. Usually the guy closest, he gets the first crack. So your first guy is just doing the, um, trying to like turn it around, like knock it on the table because that's never worked. And then goes for it, can't get it. And so by now, the second guy has already grabbed a dish towel. He's like, give me that. Takes the bottle, goes for it. Can't get it. The third guy is the guy who's kind of been like watching the whole situation. He's like, okay, I see what's happening here. And, and uh, he, he actually saw the towel slip like a millimeter. And so he's like, this is how I do this now. And it's not just a regular moment for him. This is life and death for the third guy, right? So he grabs like the rubber jar grips or some pad. He's like, this is gonna work. He grabs it. You think he's gonna pass out doing this or break this bottle in half? Like this is his moment. Can't get it. Now, can I tell you who Jesus is in this story? Jesus is the fourth guy that when you finally hand him the bottle, in a moment he goes, it's not a twist off. And he hands you living water in the wilderness. We spend forever knocking and nailing a jar on the table when Jesus is standing there going, I will open it for you. I will open it for you. We let this busyness of life, right? All this hecticness and this pressure. And, Man, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read a verse. I don't have time to do these things with Jesus. Or we're self-sustaining. Like, man, I wanna be self-made. I'm self-sustained. I don't need help. And we won't take a second to ask the one person who can actually do something about it. So what's your bottle? What are you trying to twist off that you need a hand of Jesus today? Hebrews 13, six says, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is my helper. Jesus understands the wilderness. He gets your wilderness and he wants to be your helper in the wilderness. And so how can we better know Jesus as our helper? Identify one area in your life that you're trying to tackle on your own and ask him for help. And if you're actually just starting a process, even better, bring him in early. Sometimes we wait until the very end, like, well, none of this worked, so let's ask Jesus. He's the fourth guy with the bottle. Try to make him the first. Man, Jesus wants to help you in your wilderness, and let's know him more as that. So Jesus is the lamb of God and our deliverer. Jesus is our help in the wilderness. And finally, Jesus is the promised land. Jesus is the promised land. When Moses sent uh, the 12 scouts out into the promised land. They were there 40 days and they come back and they're like, hey, the land is actually amazing. There's this incredible fruit. They had it on a plate with a flower. So Moses was like, wow, this is high quality stuff. They're like, this fruit's incredible. It's actually a land flowing with milk and honey. They're going, this place is amazing. But they were afraid of the people, the cities and these giants that were down there. All the scouts were afraid except for two guys. Joshua and Caleb. 
And Joshua and Caleb were like, look, this land is awesome. And if God's with us, we can take it. Let's go. They didn't say let's go. I added that. But I imagine I would have been friends with Caleb and Joshua because they're like, dude, giants down there, let's get this. Come on. If God's with us, we can take them. And so they're not afraid. And and for us, how, how do we go in a place of our life where we go, man, there's giants. There's things to overcome. There's fear. How do we get from a place of that to going, you know what, if God's with us, we can take it, let's go. We need to do what Joshua did before he even scouted out the promised land. In the wilderness, there was a, a, a tent of meeting that Moses established before the tabernacle was built. And Moses would take this tent with them as they went through the wilderness. And this is where God came and spoke to him face to face. God's presence would fill the tent. And in Exodus 33, it says that Joshua would go in there with him. 33, verse 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one who speaks to a friend. We talked about that. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Joshua did not leave the tent. He's going, man, I can't leave God's presence. This is incredible. This is amazing. I cannot leave his presence. And Joshua knew something that is really important for us to know in that. He started to experience the promised land in that tent way before he gets there because he knows the promised land is not a place, it's a person. The promised land is not a place, it's a person. And so how do we get from giants in my life into the promised land? Whatever it takes, God, let's do it. We sit in the presence of God. We experience Jesus. We experience Jesus as the promised land. And then when you need to take on giants, you're filled with confidence. You're filled with these promises of God. And uh, one thing that I love in, in the promised land, as we see these descriptions of it throughout Exodus, is, is, is there's this description of the fruit there. Like, man, there's this amazing fruit, and then it's flowing with milk and honey. And so fruit in the New Testament, it's really described as like these visible outcomes, these characteristics, these actions that come from a relationship with Jesus and works of the Holy Spirit. That's how fruit is really described when fruit's used in the New Testament. And when you follow Jesus, when you're with him in the promised land, the fruit is incredible. Galatians 5, through 23 says, but the fruit of the spirit, so when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, the spirit now dwells inside of you and the fruit, the outcomes, characteristics, and actions that come from that is this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit of knowing Jesus. So the promised land has fruit, this description of incredible fruit, and then it has milk and honey. Now think about milk and honey. Milk is sustenance, right? It sustains you. Think about a baby. They can't grow without milk. You need it to grow. So Jesus is the promised land. He will provide, he will sustain you. But now honey, that's a luxury. Honey's extravagant. When I hear honey in the the Bible, I'm like, God gets me. We were at a hotel one time at a pool, Kelsey and I, and someone came down bathing suit, but then they had this bathrobe on. And we were like, oh, that looks comfy. That looks luxurious. And we kind of had this, this, this subconscious belief in the back of our minds, that's probably not available to us. That's probably, there was something special about that person or something special for them. That's actually not available to us. When every room in the hotel had two bathrobes in every closet. It was available to us right now in this moment. And that's what happens in this. Jesus is the promised land. He is available to us now. He's flowing with milk and honey. He has sustenance and extravagance that is available to us right now. So the Israelites, right, they're afraid. They don't enter the promised land. They wander around for 40 years. And it's not till Joshua 21, 43 that they finally enter the promised land. 43 says this, so the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors and they took possession of it and settled there. So from Exodus one, the birth of Moses, the death of Moses, Israel settling in the promised land, that took a long time. Exodus one to the promised land is this, five books of the Bible, 187 chapters, 5,153 verses, 125 years, four generations. And it didn't need to take that long. And for us, 
right now that we have Jesus as the promised land, we can know him, trust him, experience him in a moment. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn. We have full access to our Lord and Savior. We can experience him and we can know him in a moment. And so how do we better know Jesus as the promised land? Sit in his presence. Sit in the presence of Jesus. Pray, worship to him. I think sometimes, um, if I'm being honest, I think sometimes what happens to me is I actually spend time with Jesus to experience the sustainability, his sustenance, but not long enough to experience the extravagance. You're like, man, if I could sit with you a little longer, when I do that, all of a sudden I experience this extra goodness, this sweetness from Jesus. Has he done it in passing when I'm praying, I got him on the go, these different seasons? Absolutely. But when I really sit in his presence and I soak it up, I experience this extravagance of his love and his mercy and his grace. So Jesus, he's the lamb of God and our deliverer. Jesus is our help in the wilderness and Jesus is the promised land. And knowing him fills us with life and joy. So as we wrap up today and as we close this series out, um, we've seen Jesus through Exodus. We see him through the scriptures. And one of the key ways to knowing him more is to take action steps to actually experience him. I wanna go back to our, our first verse, Exodus 33, 13. And look at what Moses says, Lord, teach me your ways so that I may know you. So how is he going to know God? It's by knowing his ways and living them out. Teach me your ways so that I may know you. Teach me your ways. Those who know Jesus take steps of obedience. They make changes. They step out in faith and in courage because they're like Joshua going, if God is with me, I can do anything. I can take anything on. It'd be a shame for us to get through the whole book of Exodus, to get through this whole series and go, that was a good book, great book, good series, learned a lot, I changed nothing in my life. We don't wanna experience that. And in Exodus three, when we saw God concerned for his people, um, them being enslaved and oppressed, and he goes, I'm gonna come rescue them. At the end in verse 10, this is what God says to Moses. He says, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh. God sends Moses. God can do whatever he wants, but he chooses to use us, his people, to accomplish his mission and his vision. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, when he sends out his disciples, he's like, God is bringing people in. He's drawing them into himself, but he uses us that as we go, we would make disciples. Right, that we would know the commands of God and that we would show Jesus' love through that. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. We need to know his commands, but if it stops there, it's for nothing. Look at how important action and obedience is to Jesus. These verses are, are in the message notes. James 2, 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. You need faith and action. Matthew 7, 24 and 25. Therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. The wilderness came and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Philippians 4, 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Put these into practice. Let the God of peace be with you in this. And so take one action step, whether it's from today or this whole Exodus series. Take one step of action, one step of obedience. Is it, is it receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior? Just be like, man, I wanna know him. Is it a step of obedience, something we've even talked about throughout this whole series? There's so much. Is it serving? Is it sharing your faith? Is it Sabbathing? Is it getting baptized? Like, what's your next step? Like, man, I wanna take this away and I wanna know Jesus more. Don't just take an action step for action's sake. We're taking this, we're walking with the Lord, taking steps of obedience to him to know Jesus more because he is the promised land. And God's desire for us is to know Jesus more. Jesus is our lamb, he's our deliverer. We're gonna have seasons of life in the wilderness. We're gonna have struggles, we're gonna have temptations. Let him help you. He 
wants to help you and he wants to use you for the good works he's prepared in advance for you to do. To call you closer to him, to call you more into your calling that he has for you and to be everyday disciples who make disciples. Not for action's sake, but to know our Lord and Savior more, King Jesus. Amen. Yeah, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending the Lamb of God whose blood is covers over us and that we get to stand before you, God, pure, spotless, without sin. We get eternal life through accepting Jesus as the Lamb of God, as the deliverer, as the one that you sent for us. Jesus, thank you that you help us in these seasons. We need you. We need your help. Jesus, thank you that you are the promised land, that we don't have to go to a location. We don't have to get a certain job. We don't have to reach a certain status. The promised land is you, Jesus. We wanna know you more. We wanna know you as that promised land. We wanna experience you, Jesus. Help protect us from being satisfied knowing about you and fill us with this desire to know you and experience you intimately. Jesus, we love you. We serve you. We pray in your name. Amen. Every week at Restoration, we take communion. I'm gonna invite our, our servers forward to prepare the tables. We go two lines down these aisles, loop around, take the bread, dip it in the cup. All the bread's gluten-free. There's no obligation. But on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it. He says, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, remember me. Right, this table is about remembering what Jesus did. And in the same breath, he took the cup. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the sins of many. Take, drink, remember me. And so as you get ready to come take communion, remember what Jesus did. Know him more through his sacrifice and his love and through his body and his blood that was broken and given for you. And let's know Jesus more as we walk out of here. Amen. Yeah, will you guys stand, come take communion. Let's worship our King.